Okay. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Femininja Project, and thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. We have a wonderful guest with us today. Oh my gosh, I just love this woman. Her name is Marcy Brockman. She is an author, an educator, artist, and host of the popular podcast, Permission to Heal, which is built on a foundation of love, a passion for what's possible, and a commitment to be an unstoppable force for good. Marcy is also an emotional abuse survivor, which she chronicles in her memoir titled Permission to Land, Searching for Love, Home, and Belonging, which is a story of hope and healing. Marcy believes that you only need your own permission to trust yourself, to follow your heart and desires, and build a life of love, home, and belonging. Marcy, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I'm thrilled to be here. This is like the highlight of my day. Oh, why, thank you. It wasn't a very exciting day, was it? Well, you know, it's teaching yeah. Pilates, you know, whatever. Oh, I didn't know you did Pilates. Yeah, I really, really, really just wanted to come home and take a nap. Yeah. I forced myself to go. And did you feel better after you did? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was, no, uh, emotionally proud of myself for having gone uh -huh. But I had been sick with the flu and bronchitis. Oh, that's and, right. And then I was getting better. And then I had, um, uh, um, what do they call that? Uh, well, I got bronchitis again. Then they, a relapse, that's the word. That's and uh, and the doctor put me on a stronger antibiotic. And today's the last day of the stronger oh. antibiotic. So I'm just, it's wiping me out. I'm just exhausted. And because I haven't gone for two weeks, you know, you don't use it, you lose it kind of thing. So yeah. it's tight and things hurt and whatever. Well, and when you're on antibiotics, that has a tendency to tighten up some of your muscles too, especially yeah. like your calf muscles and everything. So, oh God, yeah. well, so I'm very proud of you for going, even though it didn't make you feel any better, at least emotionally and psychologically. It's like, yes, I'm making a comeback. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So Marcy, how did you come to this point in time where you've got this wonderful podcast? You know, you're an artist, you are an English teacher, a high school English teacher. Again, I salute you for that. Bless your heart. You. Um, and all of the wonderful things that you do, you wrote this book. How did you get to this point in your life? Well, I, I would like to say, I don't know why I would like to say it, but I would like to say that it was <clears throat> a goal and I was laser focused and I made it happen. But that's a lie. Mm. Um, life just sort of unfolded in a very organic kind of way. You know, I, I, I think I've always been a writer. I've always been an artist. Even as a kid, my way of processing experiences and emotions was through journal writing, which I've been writing in journals since 1983. And and really drawing before that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that what I was doing is called in the therapeutic world, expressive writing, and that it was good for my brain and my body. Who knew? Mm -hmm. I just knew that I was an only child in a very dysfunctional household. And I didn't have a whole heck of a lot of people to talk to. You know, there were certain things in the seventies, people didn't kind of air their family dysfunction or dirty laundry out in public, you know? Mm -hmm. And kids, little kids don't, preteens, really, you know, we don't talk about that sort of thing, you know, especially then. And, uh, and it was kind of my only outlet. Anyway, so I just always processed things that way. And then after my mom died, well, I just, I became an English teacher. I'm, I'm going to go backwards so that this actually makes sense. Um, when I graduated from college as an English major, I wasn't an education major. I wanted to do some sort of business thing. And mm. and when I graduated, I had a job in publishing. I had a job as a computer graphic designer. I had a job um, doing public relations in Manhattan. I had a job managing a men's clothing store in New Jersey. Um, I was a, a wedding and portrait photographer. Uh, I did fundraising and public relations for the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Like I just kept trying things at, at which I had some skill or some skill that I had acquired along the way I could apply. So mm -hmm. I would try a job that, well, that sounds nice. I, I think I could, you know, support myself doing that. And that sounds interesting. But with every single one of them, 
within six or eight months, I was bored out of my freaking skull. Oh. And there was no way if I can't last a year without wanting to run in the opposite direction, there was no way I can do this the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I just kept switching jobs. And it wasn't until I left the Boys and Girls Clubs of America that I realized that the best part of that job was the time that I got to work with the kids. So when I was doing fundraisers or I was doing PR for events that the kids were involved in, that was fun. Mm -hmm. You know, pushing the paper, working in the office, dealing with the board of directors, that's boring as hell. Someone mm -hmm. else might love that, was it not my, my thing. Um, and so I, I sat down with my aunt, my mom's younger sister, and she, she basically just said, well, where do you see your life in 10 years? You know, what, what values do you, you know, what, what things about a job or a career do you value? What, what, what brings meaning to your life? You know, and we were talking and she said that if she was me, she would become a teacher because I said, I don't know if I'll ever get married, but I definitely want children. And she's like, well, mm. if you want kids, the best thing you can do is be a teacher and then you're off when they're off kind of thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was hemming and hawing and she looked at me and she's like, would you just cut the crap? We've all known that you're a teacher since you were five. You've been fighting it. And I'm like, cause no one freaking told me. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you all clue me in if you saw this as an obvious thing, you know? So um, I went back to school, got my master's, got certified, became a teacher. And again, my track record with careers was kind of abysmal. So I thought, there's no way I'm going to last more than a few years at this, mm -hmm. 10 years at the most. And and this is my 27th year. Wow. And although I'm sort of annoyed by the politics of education and you know, the, the, the inadequacies of administration and yada, yada, yada. I still love my job. Mm -hmm. So take all of the other grown ups out and just put me in my classroom with my children, with my teenagers, mm -hmm. and I'm good. Mm -hmm. um, so that's super fun. Um, personally, though, you know, you had alluded to this in my in, in the introduction. I was raised as an only child. Um, my mom was an undiagnosed bipolar oh. and um, a hypochondriac, and she exhibited very inconsistent personality quirks, shall we mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. that I always interpreted as narcissism mm. because that's how it felt. That's what it looked like. But it really were just typical ways that bipolarity manifests in people. And so I grew up feeling like I was walking on eggshells all the time. I never mm -hmm. knew what version of my mother I was going to get. Um, my childhood brain named her two halves, Cruella de Vil and, Mary, and Snow White so, or oh. Mary Poppins. So, you know, she could be either one of those Disney characters at any moment. <clears throat> and there wasn't any consistency with how she would respond to a particular type of event. So the same type of thing could happen four times and she would react in four different oh, ways. Wow. So it was really impossible for me to predict. Um, my dad, he always had to work like 99 jobs because my mom never worked outside of the home or never mm -hmm. consistently outside of the home. And I'm sure he did everything he could to not be with my mother because from even before I was born, their marriage was miserable. Mm. Why neither one of them were, were willing to end it, I don't know, but they got married in 1964. So, you know, divorce wasn't as talked about or common or acceptable or mm -hmm. whatever. Even when my dad left my mom in 1983, my mother was mortified because she didn't know any of her friends who got divorced or whose husbands left and... You know, so what society says about the things that we do and feel often really impact what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so my relationship with my mother really didn't evolve. It always stayed me being the diplomat and the people pleaser, sublimating everything I wanted just to make her happy. Because when she was happy, my life was safe and right. easier. 
and and I didn't know that I only had like a modicum of control over her happiness and that it really wasn't up to me. But as a kid, you know, you're willing to do anything to make yourself mm -hmm. feel safe, you know. Um, and so I grew up with this as my emotional template, as my relationship template. And every single romantic relationship and quite a few platonic friendships that I had were mirrored on this same template that I don't get what I want. And I shut my mouth and I be a good sport and I just solve other people's problems and do everything I can to prove my value to them so that mm -hmm. I am worthy of love. Mm. And I married my first husband under that template and he was a narcissist, a raging, mm -hmm. awful narcissist. And, uh, our relationship was terrible from the beginning. I married him anyway. Lord, the hell knows why. <laughs> and we had two kids who I am grateful for every single day of my life. Mm -hmm. And and then we got divorced after 11 years. And um, shortly after that, my mother became crazily addicted to opiates. Oh. She had hurt her neck or something. And got her first prescription to for Vicodin or one mm. of the oxys, who the hell knows, and and then made it her job to doctor shop so that Ugh. she could get medicine. And it was before the national database. It was before people right. were keeping track. And she would get, you know, she was a pain in the ass, hypochondriacal woman. <gasps> and the doctors didn't want to deal with her. Right. You know, they're human. It's hard to blame them too much. But she'd insist on every test, even though there was nothing wrong. They would never find anything. And she would always swear that they were quacks, that there was definitely something wrong. And she'd go find another doctor after securing, you know, like the, the 7-Eleven big gulp size of a right. prescription for some sort of oxycodone or something. So she had amassed a boot-sized shoebox wow. filled with prescriptions. Some were psychotropic things like Welbutrin or Xanax or whatever, and but most of them were opiates. And uh, she used to show that box off like she was proud. You know, look at this box that I have, you know. And then when she would get dark, she would say things like, I could kill myself tonight with oh. all the things that are in this box. I have a boot-sized shoebox that tells me that I have control over when I die. I could die tonight. There's nothing oh. worth living for. And I'm like, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> and, you and, you're, and, you're and I'm kid. like, and you're I'm like a, a teenager or I'm like an oh. early 20 something person. And Ooh. I'm like, well, what the freaking hell am I going to do with this? You know? And, uh, and I, I was in therapy and my therapist is like, you don't have any control unless she hurts you and you call the police or you think she's a danger to herself. And then you call the police. There's nothing you can do about it because she's a grown up, you know? Mm. So, yeah, so that was a big mess. Um, and then at the age of 69, which is 10 years ago, my mom died. Mm -hmm. um, was it suicide, finally? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Was it just congested, con con what do they call it, con congestive heart failure mm -hmm. as a result of long-term drug abuse? Right. Who knows? But she took a nap one afternoon and just didn't wake up. And um, I had not spoken to her for 18 months prior to her death mm. because she had the addiction killed her the addiction mm -hmm. took over her brain and my mother janet ceased to exist about mm. 20 months or so before she died mm. it had just gotten so bad it took over everything there was no semblance of the generous beautiful person she had been mm -hmm. when she wasn't cruella de vil and um, and she had come over to my house and verbally attacked me in my own living room. And then when she realized I wasn't taking the bait, she started attacking my kids who Ooh. were who were tw uh, like nine and 12 at the time, something like that. Mm -hmm. And they were hysterical, like terrified and ran down the hallway into my daughter's room and locked the door and like were huddling on her bed in the far oh. corner of the room crying. And and there was like a light switch, Cheryl, where I it, literally as quick as turning on a light, I went from subservient, 
victimized daughter to fucking powerful lioness mom protecting her cubs and her den. And I kicked my mother out of my house. Mama bear. Done. Get out. You can't come into my peaceful home and attack me and my kids here. It's just not mm-hmm. going to happen. And and after that, I wrote her a letter because I knew talking wouldn't work because she wouldn't listen. Right. I wrote her a long letter and I explained our entire relationship, how much I loved her, what she needed to do in order to keep us in our in her life, which was inpatient drug treatment treat treatment counseling and behavioral therapy, and I would be there every single day for the rest of her life, holding mm-hmm. her hand through the whole thing, mm-hmm. or. If she refused to do anything, she would never see me or her grandchildren again. Mm. And she was really beyond reaching at that point Mm -hmm. and scoffed at the letter and, you know, who the hell are you? You're not a doctor. You're an idiot. You know, you have no idea what you're talking about, you know, because she just couldn't be without the drugs. And, And I had a lot of reckoning to deal with. You know, mm-hmm. here's I, there's that, that part of me, that intellectual cognitive part of my brain that realizes that the addiction really did end my mother's existence before she died. And so it really wasn't her making the choice. But then the little girl in me who mm. always wanted her mother's love was like, my mother chose drugs over me. I'm her only child. What the mm. hell is that? You know, so I had a lot of stuff to unpack. Mm -hmm. And during that year and a half, um, I set up an art studio in my house. Mm -hmm. Happens to be the room I'm sitting in now talking to you. And my daughter's also an artist. I used to joke that instead of being born with a silver spoon, you know, that cliche, (laughs) she was born with a crayon in her hand, Uh you know, like she came out of the womb drawing. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have two drafting tables and lots of paint and every kind of art supply you could think of. And this became our sanctuary. And I... Mm -hmm painted my way through my emotionality of dealing with the closure and all of the toxicity of of Mm. my mom my relationship with my mother and I was in therapy every week and writing in my journals but I really think that the big thing for me was creating visual art Mm -hmm. and somewhere is like a magic elixir you know the the, the feeling of the brush in my hand or the paint marker, whatever it is that I'm doing and mixing the color and figuring out the design and the sh- and just like creating something spontaneously takes over enough of my brain where I'm not aware that I'm processing trauma and mm-hmm. experiences like in the back of my brain. I don't know enough about neuroscience to know really mm-hmm. the mechanics of what I'm talking about, but this is what it feels like. Mm-hmm. And I I learned patience. I learned that everything but death can be done over. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't like a painting. You could either throw it out or repaint the canvas and start over again. You know, like there's there's no such thing as as not being able to redo it. Um, And I started to forgive myself and I started to see myself as creative and capable and yet flawed and and loving and mm-hmm. um and my kids were in therapy like we were really all digging deep to try to figure this out because i made it my mission to end the intergenerationality of this mental illness and this addiction mm-hmm. and and i started you know i read everything that is recommended i i listen to i'm an avid podcast listener and i listen to all sorts of things and Lately, I've been dissecting the epigenetics of our family Mm. and thinking about how each generation of women in my mom's side of the family, I was just really at this point looking, looking that way. Mm -hmm. And, and if we go back to my great grandmother who emigrated from Russia in 1899 to Springfield, Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. um, she left Russia to escape the pogroms that were chasing Jews and killing Jews around. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they murdered lots of people in her village and all people, a lot of people that she knew. And so she left at the age of 18, crossed the Atlantic to marry a man who she knew back in Russia, who had come a couple of years ahead. He was living in Springfield, Massachusetts with his brother. And they got married when they got here. 
and they had all in all they had seven children four mm-hmm. daughters one of whom was my grandmother and three sons all of whom died before the age of one oh. and so she left her family because of a pogrom moved to a new country her husband my great-grandfather was not very nice to her and he was a drunk ladies man spent all their money pain in the ass she oh. had four uh, th- four little girls three babies die in their infancy lived through the depression both world wars and a lot of to- a lot of trauma yeah right so then she passes along all of that trauma to her four daughters they grew mm-hmm. up in poverty they lived in tenement housing in brooklyn they hardly oh. knew when they had money or they had enough money for rent food was scarce if it wasn't for um, charities they wouldn't have had proper cl- uh, uh, boots on their feet for the winters and they wouldn't have had winter coats and she worked at, and had to leave her kids home alone because there needed to be somebody who was working while my great-grandfather was out doing whatever the hell he was doing so my grandmother and her three sisters were brought up in poverty in during the depression during world war one I, I mean world war ii rather then they all came of age and one at a time got married and you know husbands off to war husbands one of them d- died in overseas um and then they had children and they were raising their children with the trauma that they had inherited right okay so now my mom is the oldest of her generation and spent a year in bed when she was eight because she had rheumatic fever oh and so she was raised by a woman who grew up in the depression who had no money And that shaped the way she ran her household. Mm -hmm. She had, she, my grandmother was the oldest. So she was very aware of the three brothers who died. And now she has a daughter who's sick. Oh, what the hell kind of trauma does that trigger? Right. And so this is what my mother's now grown up in. And now she's raising me. And so my mom was sick from a very young age, which adds to the hypochondriasis. Right. And she was born chemically imbalanced bipolar. And with all the stigmas that we used to have that we're, thank goodness, working Mm -hmm. really hard to eradicate right now against mental health, mental illness and therapy and so on, she was very reluctant to allow a diagnosis, even though she was Mm -hmm. actively going to therapists, she just resisted the diagnosis. Oh, they don't know what they're talking about. So so I started looking at all of this and Mm -hmm. it made me realize that I'm just another cog in the chain or another link in the chain of this. Right. And it made me feel much less victimized. I didn't feel like like I was a victim. I didn't feel like I was picked on. I didn't feel in any way like I was lacking or there was something wrong with me or any of the things that I used to think because now all of the experiences as each in for each successive generation explained to me the behavior and why things were the way they were did that give you a sense of compassion oh my god for, compassion for your mom and, and yes, understanding absolutely. of like well that explains a lot of things absolutely absolutely mm-hmm. and it was through all of that that i kind of realized that her behavior was because of the trauma was because of things she inherited from her mother and her grandmother and her mm-hmm. great and her aunts but but um also because it really wasn't any of the things i you know none of it was going to be my ability mm-hmm. to fix or mitigate you know there was nothing that i was going to be able to do that was going to make it better for her and mm-hmm. so any sense of failure that I might have had coming out of my adolescence just disappeared. It was wow. no longer there. It was so freeing to think about all of this this way, mm-hmm. you know, and I've kind of sort of taken it, uh, taken it a step further. So now I'm almost 54. Um, I had a hysterectomy three years ago, obviously menopausal because I don't own all the plumbing's gone. Um <laughs> And then I've had weight gain Mm -hmm. because of that. And I'm having a really hard time losing it. And I started, you know, I'm doing all the like the menopause research and hormonal balance and and I can't do HRT because I 
I became suicidal or, or suicidal ideation within six days. And mm. there was just no way I can't do that. Um, so I started thinking about intergenerationality of physical trauma. Now we're not mm -hmm. just talking mental. So I've had food insecurity in two generations of my family mm. that oh. I can count with the poverty and leaving right. Russia for the pogroms and running away from our village because we don't know if we're going to get killed and then coming here and being poor and then the depression. You know, there's been a lot of food insecurity. Western European or Eastern, where uh, Western and Eastern European Jews for thousands of years have been, you know, nomadically shoved out of where they lived and persecuted and so on. And there's always been. So I think I have the hips I have because of my heritage, you know, and so I'm not I'm, I'm suddenly also less bothered by how my body looks. Mm hmm. You know, it's just been so freeing to realize that I don't have as much control over things as society or the diet industry or whatever would have made me feel I, sh I mm -hmm. should have had. I don't know if that That's, sentence made sense at all, but it made sense to me. That's interesting. I just uh, read a book called um, Eat to Live. And the only yeah. reason why I bought the book was because somebody online who I follow and kind of friends with and, oh, this is a wonderful book. You know, she's a stroke survivor at wow. a young age, like 50. She was 50 when she had a stroke and had to fight her way back from aphasia and a lot of other issues. And interestingly enough, she was still aphasic when she joined Toastmasters. Wow. Yeah, that's huge. It was really huge part of her therapy that she made herself do. And she now has a podcast and has written a book of her own. But I thought, okay, well, if she recommended this book must be good. So I, I, I did read it and it is a fascinating book, but it's, you know, it's about eating healthy and weight loss and blah, 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 and all that stuff. But, you know, diets do not work. And this is why. And right. he did go into um, kind of like genetic or hereditary, you know, um, weight gain, weight loss type of thing right. of, you know, that our DNA changes, you know, the people who lived in Ireland and all the famine and stuff. And so the metabolism had to slow down so they could survive. So right. they, he, it was something he said about people who have a slow metabolism. And it's like, well, that's actually good because that is for survival. So I yeah. find that fascinating that you figured that out on your own. You're so smart. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all of this, uh, healing journey, this this mm -hmm. path towards mental wellness, really, um, is what motivated me writing my book, Permission to mm -hmm. Land. And mm -hmm. it, it really unravels my whole relationship with my mom and how all of that affected me and the decisions I made in my life and then how I slowly sort of un- nodded the mm -hmm. string of that to, mm -hmm. to to straighten all of that out and it it's mostly chronological with some flashback but but uh it chronicles my my whole life and i i changed names mm -hmm. so not like my husband's name is still my husband because he didn't mind being named but otherwise i mm -hmm. changed everyone's name because i didn't want to tell other people's story in a way right. that they were uncomfortable right so you know, and in a couple of cases, I conflated a few people because why tell this? It took, if it took me four times to learn the same lesson, you don't need to read about it four times. One right. will suffice, you know. Yes. So, um, yeah, so I wrote the book. And and when uh, was the book released? The book was released in July of 2020, right in the middle of COVID lockdown. Oh, great time to launch a book. What yeah. the hell, right? You yeah. can't do any book tours and you can't no, sign anything. No. You couldn't but, have planned it better. Yeah. But I, I had all this time. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished writing and my editor finished what he was doing. And, you know, the book cover designer did her part. And Oh, so by I, the way, that is a fantastic cover. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. The, the yeah. original concept for this came from an article that I wrote in Jan January of 2015 called Choosing Our People Wisely. Mm -hmm. And basically, I was talking about how I didn't feel like I was in my life. I felt mm -hmm. like I was an airplane endlessly hovering the runway, waiting for permission to land. So at that point in January of 15, I didn't feel like I was in control of my own life. 
I felt like I was waiting for someone else to fix it, to give me permission to do something. I was looking for external validation and control. Mm -hmm. And after that is when I figured out that the only person who can do any of the things I was waiting for is me. Mm -hmm. And there's no such thing as external control or validation or none of that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. You know, the only person who's going to get me to eat healthy, the only person who's going to get me to therapy or get my eight hours of sleep every night or, you know, wh whatever the things are that I want to do, the only person who can affect any change in my life is me. Mm -hmm. And it was a lesson my mother never learned. And, and I wanted to make sure that I could impart that concept to as many people as possible. And, and I know that although my story is particularly mine, mm -hmm. it's also so universal. Yes. There are, I have met thousands, so many people who have gone through very similar traumas in their lives mm -hmm. and have told me that they've found inspiration and assistance in the book and it's not a typical self-help book it's a right. it's a it's a memoir i don't ever right. say do this this and this mm -hmm. but if it you see it works for me maybe it's something you want to try right um and then as the book was being published i decided that since journal writing was so important to me in my own healing i designed a guided journal, a companion journal called, it's also Permission to Land is the same title, but the subtitle is Personal Transformation Through Writing. And it's over mm -hmm. 200 pages of guided writing prompts mm -hmm. and space to write if you wanna write in the book um, that basically will take the reader or the journal writer on the same journey I went through when writing my book because I used all of my journal entries from 1983 as primary wow. source documents when I was going back to remember what happened in 1984, what happened in 1989. Because mm -hmm. I can't trust my 50 some year old memory to accurately <laughs> depict what happened when I was 14. Mm -hmm. There's no way. Mm -hmm. But I have my own words mm -hmm. in front of me, you know? So I was reading my journals and there were so many things I remembered and I felt and it was so cathartic to go back and read. But there were just as many things that I was writing about passionately that I had no memory of at all. Wow. None. Like I was reading fiction from someone else's life. There, was, there were whole months of my senior year of high school where I was obsessed, angry at this girl named Carla. I have no idea who Carla was. No idea. I even called my high school best friend, who I'm still in semi-contact semi with, and I mm -hmm. asked her who Carla was. She didn't even remember. Oh, that's so funny. Did you pull out your um, yearbook and look? No, she wasn't in our grade. Oh. Oh, but the, the younger grades were in there. Yeah. You're so I brilliant. Mean, I never thought to do that. Yeah, it's a gift. But yeah, no, there's, um, yeah, because there's I'm always, there's go like three, three after years. After we're done here, yeah. and I'm going to go look up Carla. Who the oh, please is email me when you do. <laughs> I know you will find her. That's so funny. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Sometimes know. you just can't see the forest for the trees. Sometimes exactly. you are in it so deep yourself that yeah. you can't see what's, you know, could be right in front of your face. That's really, exactly. really interesting. So I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Sure. Um, so do you talk about all of this with your kids? Oh, yeah. yeah. They know everything. Mm -hmm. They lived through a lot of it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I talk about all of it with them. Um, mm -hmm. they, they witnessed my relationship with my mom because they had their own relationship with her. They mm -hmm. witnessed the end of my relationship with my mm -hmm. mother and then yeah. her dying. Mm -hmm. And I had to contextualize that in some age appropriate right. way for them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and use her life as the cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what happens when you abuse drugs you shouldn't be taking. Mm -hmm. Don't do this, you know. Um, but she she had a, a really loving, generous, wonderful side that mm -hmm. my daughter really clung to and mm -hmm. still has so many more beautiful memories of time she spent with my mom when my mom was Mary Poppins than mm -hmm. I seem to have right now. Mm -hmm. And um, my daughter's graduating from college um, in two days, actually. Oh, congrats. Congrats. Three days? Saturday, whenever Saturday is. Muscle and tough. Thank you. And she uh, she's a creative writing major. So her senior thesis was a poetic memoir. 
and she wrote about her life and in poetry, which I don't know how you do that, but she, it was, it's wonderful. Uh And, um, and she dedicated it to me and my mom. Wow. Because of the, you know, the family connection, because of Mm -hmm. we're taught, we taught her how to love kind of thing, Mm -hmm. you know? So that's so sweet. Yeah, Yeah, it's very sweet. So So, another question, um, because I, I mean, I do find this fascinating. I mean, you know, um, I have roots in Eastern Europe. My father um, actually was an immigrant from Czechoslovakia. He and my grandmother got out on the last ship out of Calais before they closed the port in um, December, December 29th of 39. I even have, yeah, I even have a copy of um, like his ticket and stuff. I know the ship that he was on and uh, some of the stories about coming Oh, it's, I mean, it's an amazing story. And, you know, I mean, my father could be a pretty rough person to be around too. And I understand why he was the way he was sometimes. And I'm amazed that he was as highly functional as as he was because of his history. And I think that once you know and can appreciate what the former generations had gone through, um, that you have a lot more of a compassion and an understanding and like, oh, okay, you know, I don't take it personally. But I was wondering if you were planning to write kind of like a family history. Um. I have been for the last couple of years tracking a lot of stuff down through Mm Ancestry.com and I don't want to pay for their membership at $29.99 a month until I know I have concentrated time to focus on this thing. Otherwise, Mm -hmm. it's just money I'm throwing out the door. Right. Um, And but I, I have a pile, a pile of handwritten letters written Mm -hmm. in Russian that were written between like 1899 and Mm. 1922, let's say, um, that went back and forth between my great-grandmother, Anna, my great-grandfather, Nathan, his brother who they lived with, and whoever they were writing to in Russia. I don't know. So I've got, I think it's mostly letters written to them from Russia. But there uh-huh. are a couple of like handwritten things in different handwriting. But I don't read Russian. Right. Um, you know, I have a student this year whose family is from Ukraine and they speak and read Russian. Um, but with the war going on and they have family over there, the yeah. last thing I want to do is bug them about yeah. it. So I'm going to have to find another translation service or something yeah. because well, I, I would need to do that before I could right. embark on it. What right an incredible gift. Yeah that you have in that. I mean, I, yeah, do I just have... found it among my mother's things that was in oh, a, wow. just a few, just, I guess about two or three years ago, I found it in a box of stuff that I had not really looked through after she died. Mm-hmm. And there they all were. Wow. Incredible story. Yeah. Interesting. interesting. Yeah. The, and the other thing too, when you said that your mom had had rheumatic fever yeah, as a child, uh, that can have an impact on the heart. So that could have been what caused her CHF. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. There's no wow. way to know. Yeah. There's no way to know. So then when did you decide to launch the podcast and how did that come about? Okay. So I I wrote the books. They both came out in the summer of 2020. And then school resumed in September. And mm-hmm. I had a feeling like there was another something that I was supposed to be doing, but I didn't quite know what it was. And, you know, you publish a book, you go on podcasts, I'm guesting on podcasts and I'm doing marketing and all this stuff. And I I just, I wasn't sure, like I'm, there's something else there. So I had a virtual guest speaker from Long Island University offer to push into my classes virtually. Mm -hmm. to give a talk on the art of the podcast. And I thought, my students are going to love this. That's awesome. So I booked him for my two senior level classes. So is this guy, Chuck Garcia, he's actually been a guest on this show, on my show, on on Permission Uh to Heal. And I've been a guest on his show, which is Climb Uh to the Top. And so, so he, he was the guy and had this whole presentation and all of the equipment that he said you needed, I already owned from when I recorded the audiobook version of my memoir. Oh, wow. Um, And 
as he was talking about theme and mission and audience, I'm like, I already have all of this figured out from my book. It's the same theme. It's the same audience. It's permission to, and I thought about it for 10 minutes and I was like, permission to heal. There we go. So before the end of the day, I already had this all figured out and not a single one of my 50 students was the slightest bit interested in anything that this man had to say. <laughs> None of them listened to podcasts. They didn't care. They were not interested. But the universe brought him for me. That is so, absolutely convinced. That's it was really like funny. A lightning bolt to my head. Uh -huh. He was there talking to me. Um, and so I, I emailed him. Thank you so much for coming. Blah, 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 whatever. Um, you inspired me. I have all these ideas about starting a podcast of my own. Do you mind if I pick your brain? Can you talk, uh, you know, later this week for about a half an hour? So we met probably on a Zoom, maybe a phone call. I don't know. <clears throat> and I was just, I wanted some sort of, yeah, you're on the right track. Go ahead. This sounds right. You know, I just wanted somebody who kind of knew what they were doing to tell me that I was doing it right. And um, within a week, the podcast was launched. Wow. I'm the kind of person that does a little bit of research and she commits herself to something and jumps in with both feet. And I figure I'll figure it out on my way. I don't have to know all the answers. I'll just figure it out as I go. Mm -hmm. And so I had a bunch of guests. I figured I, I have Facebook friends in, in publishing groups and in men mental health and wellness groups and in marketing groups. And, you know, there's just people, you know, and almost everybody in those circles is looking to promote something. Right. Um, and I got myself listed on Podmatch and Matchmaker FM and a bunch of other places mm -hmm. and uh, and somehow started getting PR agents contacting me to and making pitches for me for their clients to be on my podcast. So, mm -hmm. like, I don't have to go hunting for anybody now. I, I'm mm -hmm. just my inbox is full and uh, and I love it from mm -hmm. the second I started. I was a little nervous, but I love it. You know, it's like getting to meet all these amazing people. I learn from every single guest. It's like therapy for me. I learn mm -hmm. so many things. Mm -hmm. And and then I just get to share it with the world. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, you know? <laughs> and how many episodes have you um, recorded? Uh, episode 70 dropped today. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. That's awesome. Yeah, they're usually about an hour long. I try to do one a week. I drop on Wednesdays. Um, I did miss two weeks when I was sick. Mm -hmm. One week when I was sick with bronchitis a month ago. And the episode 70 should have dropped last week. But I was mm -hmm. so sick again. I just couldn't even focus on because I do everything myself. Right. I do all yeah, the editing and all of that yeah. stuff. So, you know, that was the part that I couldn't do. I kept falling mm -hmm. asleep while I was editing. And I knew it wasn't the episode. It was the medicine right. I was on. So. But, well, now, so how can people find the podcast? Podcast is everywhere you listen to podcasts. Spotify, mm -hmm. Apple, Amazon, iTunes, everywhere you listen to podcasts, it's there. Um, there are also links on all my social media. You can find me on Instagram at Marcy Brockman 27 or just Marcy Brockman on Twitter and Facebook and mm -hmm. TikTok and everything else. Um, and there are links. And my website, very easy, MarcyBrockman.com, gets you links to everything. The books, all my art which is available for sale, at least the originals and custom prints and scarves that I make out of my artwork and mm -hmm. um, and the podcast links and everything else. And the book. And the book. You can find the yeah. book that way too. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can buy the book, paperback, hardcover, um, the memoir and the journal, get them you know, personally signed by me. You can buy them through the website or the books are available anywhere you would buy books online. Mm -hmm. um, I have on bookshop.org, I have created a Permission to Heal podcast bookshop where I have linked all of my guests' books for all of the episodes. Not everyone's an author, but, you know, mm -hmm. all of the episodes and my own books. And they get, if you buy them on the Permission to Heal bookshop on bookshop.org, they get purchased from a local and independent bookstore in nice. your area and then sent to you so that you're supporting local and independent bookshops and not the big machine of capitalism. Yep. Yep. You know, and I did want to let the audience know that I was a guest on your show. Yes, and you were. We had a great time. You're a wonderful host and I really appreciate, um, you know, the opportunity to be on your show. It was so wonderful. I think your episode 
drops either next week or the week after. So mm -hmm. probably by the end of May, your your episode will drop. So excellent, That's excellent, very exciting. Okay, so I just, I mean, your story is so amazing, and I mean, I just, I, I can't, I can't emphasize enough how some of the things that you did were really helping you heal. Yes. And so I want you to just talk a little bit more, you know, just the writing, the drawing, the painting, um, the way that you were, you know, finding those as outlets to express yourself. And so the audience might be thinking, well, I can't paint. I it doesn't draw. matter. It doesn't matter. Exactly. So you can, you can get the same cathartic healing benefit from coloring in an adult coloring book. Mm -hmm. You can get the same benefit from drawing stick figures on a piece of paper. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. You can just doodle swirls with a crayon or a pencil. It, it doesn't matter the medium or the design or the, the you know, uh, aesthetic value. You know, I don't know how to put that otherwise. It doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. Um, art's all subjective anyway. I could love mm -hmm. my paintings and someone else could hate them or vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, who mm -hmm. knows? But it's, it's the act of doing it mm -hmm. that is very freeing you know like when i when i'm writing in my journal which you can handwrite or type i have an app called day one that's connected on my mac and my iphone so that i can type it on either way place and it just uploads mm -hmm. you know it's, it syncs and um you know just the act of expressing to yourself and not worrying about spelling or grammar or, you know, right. any of that. You're not editing yourself. You're just like mentally brain dumping information. Just the act of expressing it is freeing. It's mm -hmm. cathartic. It, it allows you to process and think about what you're experiencing and just get it out. Mm -hmm. You know, like like there have been writing exercises at, at various workshops that I've taken over the years where they have you write a letter to somebody you're angry at, let's say, mm -hmm. and you get to express all the things, why you're angry, to rage, blah, 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 but you're not going to mail the letter. You're not going to send it to anyone. You're going to write it. You're going to read it out loud, and then you're going to rip it up and throw it in the garbage. Mm -hmm. Do you know the freedom of that? Mm -hmm. that you've got to get all of that out so that it's not bottled up. I think mm -hmm. the danger, danger, I'll put that in air quotes, of trauma, mental illness, mm -hmm. um, any any of that toxic, traumatic stuff that, that whirls around in your brain is mm -hmm. that when we allow our imaginations and mm -hmm. that little, you know, annoying monkey brain inside mm -hmm. to just constantly run the tape of that, over and mm -hmm. over and over and over and over again. With each pass around, it gets a little loopier and a little yeah. crazier and a little less grounded in reality and a little more emotional and a little more dramatic. And you have to stop that hula hooping monkey. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting metaphor. I like that. Yeah, that so, really is. I have a the, guest the who's a hula hooping, hooping mama. Well, there she you go. She calls she, that's what her <laughs> therapy was, you know, hula hooping. Hula hooping. Okay. So for me, the way to stop that hula hooping monkey was to write about all the things that I was telling myself in my head. Mm -hmm. And it takes the power away from it. What, what mm -hmm. do they say? That, that um, pain and shame like mushrooms grow well in the dark. Mm -hmm. Something and like that. And when you feed them crap. Yeah. Right. So you got to shine the light on it and how are you going to do that well you can do it in talk therapy you can mm -hmm. talk with your best friend or your spouse or whoever mm -hmm. your person is or if you want you can write to yourself in a journal form and just get mm -hmm. it all out there mm -hmm. you know and you're not censoring yourself no one's can no one's going to read it you can say mm -hmm. whatever the hell you want to say mm -hmm. and it short circuits that hula hooping crazy monkey in my head mm -hmm and allows me to get some calm. And I find that painting or drawing does the same thing for me. Mm -hmm. For instance, the last couple of months between being sick and there've been some drama with, my, with our kids and you know, everything's fine, all works out in the wash, but on the day to day, some days are stressful. And so I've been drawing every single night mm -hmm. i bought myself a couple of sets of really great markers that i love 
and a couple of adult coloring books and a sketch pad. And mm-hmm. sometimes I do neurographic art, like the painting that's behind mm-hmm. me, where yeah, it's I all love just that swirls one. and stuff. And it's very organic and intuitive. And you can make it anything you want. And there's no way to do it so it's wrong. And mm-hmm. it always looks pretty. Or if I'm not really in the mood for that, and I just want the idea of coloring without any thought or design or anything, um, I'll color an adult coloring book. And I bought one that has like positive affirmations on it too. Mm-hmm. So. And I, I do at least one or two of those every single night. And I could be doing that while I'm listening to music or my husband and I are having a conversation or while we're watching TV or mm-hmm. whatever. It doesn't matter. But the act of doing it, I find very meditative. Mm-hmm. It, it takes a portion of my brain that focuses on that thing and sort of quiets the crazy internal monologue that otherwise would be running. Mm-hmm. And I just, I find it really relaxing, you know? Mm -hmm. And if art's not your thing, you know, I have an aunt who loves to wash dishes. And the the act of actually washing your dishes can be meditative also. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very sensory. You've got the water Mm -hmm. and the soap. You've got a sponge, you know, you've got the sound of the water. The process of doing that, you have to be in the moment to do it. Because, you know, you, you don't want to break the glass and cut your mm-hmm. hand and you want to make sure that you're cleaning it. Mm-hmm. So just the act of doing that, um, almost anything, if you're mindful about the process of doing it, mm-hmm. almost anything can be meditative and serve to short circuit the hula hooping monkey in your brain. Mm-hmm. I used to knit. And I stopped, uh, gosh, it's been about 12 years ago and I really need to pick it back up again. Um, but the very first time I learned how to knit, um, yeah, I was probably, I was in my very early twenties and it was because I had a boyfriend who kept dragging me to basketball games with him. Right. And it was like, oh God, I don't want to go. Oh honey, I want you to come with me. I need your company. It's like, Ugh. and one day when he took me to the game and I had my ballet slippers and I had to sew my ribbons on. So I took that that with me and I sewed my ribbons and it's like, I need to learn how to knit because the game was over. He didn't care. I didn't have to pay attention. I got something that was therapeutic, you know, and and then my ribbons were on. So I did learn how to knit and I actually ended up being a master knitter. Wow. I know. And I I knitted probably until my mid thirties, early thirties stopped. And then I picked it up again about 12 or 13 years later. And it was a time in my life where I was under an awful lot of stress, anxiety, and a really, you know, just having issues. And I would pick up those needles and there was something so soothing about the click of the needles, the rhythm that it made, just the, the texture of the yarn, of the yeah, yarn absolutely. and the color. And then, you know, just, it was so incredible. And then I would end up with something beautiful to wear. That's I mean, awesome. it was just wonderful. Yeah. So it's time to pick them up again, but. That's awesome. Yeah. I- I've but- also, for the last few weeks, really, maybe the last month or two, I've been walking around. Sounds really strange to say, but I've been walking around with a stuffed animal, a small little squish oh. mallow that's like a cat slash unicorn in mm-hmm. my purse all the time. And it's something soft and squishy and comforting. And it helps with the anxiety a little bit. You know, if I can't draw or I'm doing something, maybe I'm teaching my class Mm -hmm. and I can walk around with this little stuffed animal in my hand. The kids don't care. And it makes me feel more comforted somehow. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And I think there's a lot about that tactile sense and that, you know, it's very comforting. It's very soothing. Anything, any time that I'm doing anything with my hands, Mm -hmm. you know, even when I'm working with a client and I'm touching them, it's, there's something about that, that sensory input that's just like, oh, I have landed, exactly. you know, exactly, exactly. So for the audience, uh, anything that you can do with your hands, anything that just, you know, uh, speaks to you, even doing your dishes. Yeah. I love that. I mean, take a walk. Yeah. Listen to the birds flirt with someone, someone's dog as they're walking their dog around the block, you know, like whatever. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be a, a big extravagant walk in the woods. Take, take a walk around your block, right. you know? And it doesn't have to be a huge uh, painting or artwork that you're doing. No. You can just scribble and doodle. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So all you, also, you also have big plans for the future. Yeah. So, so the, the whole process of this 
has sort of been taking me on this journey. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, with thinking there was something more and then finding the podcast or inventing the podcast, I still felt like there was something kind of missing. And I, I sort of envisioned myself having like an advice column or um, like a call-in sell uh, advice show of some sort. Like so Ask for Marcy. The, right, something. So um, in the spring of last year, excuse me, I had a bunch of guest spots on the Podcast Business News Network. And a lot of people were were identifying with my story and, and, and the whole process of all of this mm -hmm. and were writing in and asking me questions about asking my advice about their life or their decisions or whatever. Wow. And so after a couple of weeks, it was only a 12 week run. And after a couple of weeks, it really became a Q and A show. And I loved it. You know, it's very clear. I'm not a registered therapist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving you any sort of professional advice. This is coming from life experience. And I'll help connect you with professionals who can actually help you. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was so much fun. And and when that ended, I, I kind of missed it. And I was like, well, what else can I do? Where can this go? You know, like what? I'm going to retire from teaching in about seven years. And then what? You know, gone are the days when people could actually afford to retire and not work anymore. You know, I'm going to have to do something. And mm. even if it wasn't financial, I'm the kind of person that needs projects. I need stuff to do. And so I woke up December 1st, 2021, just six months ago. I woke up with this epiphany that I'm going to go back to school, get a third master's degree, and I'm going to become a therapist. Mm -hmm. And I rolled over in bed and my husband was already up and I told him and I was really imagining him saying, you're a moron. You're 53 years old. You're going back to school. What are you nuts? But he he was like, oh, my God, that's such a great idea. You'd be great at that. And I told both of my sisters, one's a psychiatrist and one's a Ph.D. clinical psychologist. And this is what they've been doing for 20 years. And so I ran this by them and they're like, oh my God, you'd be so great at that. Of course you're not too old. Absolutely, go ahead, do it, do mm -hmm. it, do it. Everybody who I was telling was having the same response. So, all right, I'll just, I'll do it. So I started doing research and I found a school and I found a program and uh, June 6th, I start a licensed mental health, uh, uh, license, L -M what is it? Licensed clinical mental health counselor. That's what it is. Um, okay, so you're going to start this even though you're still teaching. But of course, I know that you're off for the summer. But so you're going to go through this program. I'm going to go through this program while I'm working. Yeah. Wow. Well, I did my I did my second master's while I was getting divorced. I had two young children in single digits of age and I was going to school online earning a ma another master's degree. So that was how I got the second one. So if I can do the second one online while raising two kids and getting a divorce, I think yeah. doing it now as an empty nester is not going to be as hard. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've you probably, know. yeah, you, right. you've gone through the acid test. This ought to be a piece of cake. Right. This should be fine. So it's two classes yeah. at a time. The classes run every 10 weeks. Then you have a week off. Um, they have five sessions, roughly five sessions a year. Um, there are two residencies where I actually have to be in Manchester, New Hampshire for a week each for each mm -hmm. one. Um, and in about two and a half years, I'll be done with all the coursework. And then I have several thousand hours of practicum and internship stuff to do, which I have no idea what that's about. But again, uh -huh. I'll figure it out as I go. Mm -hmm. um, and so in roughly four years ish, I assuming I pass everything and I pass the licensing exam, I'll be a credentialed licensed clinical mental health counselor. So and then will you open up your own practice, do you think, or? I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It depends on, I think, what my experiences are in my internship and my practicum. Mm -hmm. I, I can sort of picture myself joining an established practice mm -hmm. rather than having to drum up my own business and manage the whole thing myself. Yeah. I think that I would rather not do the entrepreneurial side of it and just do the therapy side of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I could also see myself working in a in a, a larger facility too with clients. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And I don't know like specialty wise, um, age group, you know, I'm thinking mm -hmm. families, couples, individuals, but not super mm -hmm. young kids and not anywhere near a school building. Um, <laughs> you know, 
and I'll do that part time until I retire and then mm-hmm. see. Mm-hmm. I don't know, well, you don't I'm, need I'm to excited. Yeah. You're somebody who figures it out as you, as you go. Yeah. And so, yeah. and everything seems to work out. Yeah. Jump in with both feet. I don't know how I'm paying for the whole thing, but you know, whatever. <laughs> There's student That'll loans. Work out too. Yeah, There's student exactly. loans. I'll pay for it at the end. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, Marcy, uh, just tell us one more time where people sure. can find you. Sure, 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 sure. So my website, marcybrockman.com is basically the hub for everything. You can Mm -hmm. get all my social media from there. You can get, you can order the book, sign copies of the books. There are links to the website. There's links to the YouTube channel for the website. Um, But you can find me at Instagram at marcybrockman27. You can find me on all other social media at just marcybrockman. The books, Permission to Land, Searching for Love, Home and Belonging, and the companion journal, Searching, uh, um, um, Permission to Land, uh, Personal Transformation Through Writing are available anywhere that you buy books online. Mm-hmm. And including Audible, I read the narrated the audiobook mm-hmm. for the memoir myself, which was super fun. Uh, what else? What else? What else? The podcast Permission to Heal. New episodes drop every Wednesday, most mm-hmm. Wednesdays, and are available for free anywhere you listen to podcasts. Excellent. Do you have any final little pearls of wisdom um, that you want to drop on the audience that you might not have covered yet? Um, just really want to reiterate the, the sort of the main mission of my whole, all of my enterprises here is to empower and inspire everyone who's listening to give themselves permission to create the life that they want for themselves, to heal the trauma if they have, and we all do, to figure out what they desire, what their goals are, what their values are, and create a life that aligns with all of that, that connects you with your family and friends and your inner heart. And learn to trust yourself because you Mm. have the power already Mm. within you. You just need your own permission to begin. Mm -hmm. That's where I'll leave you. Absolutely. Very beautifully said. Thank Thank you you. so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. I always love talking to you. (laughs) Yes, this is great. I I made a new friend. I'm excited. I know, really. And so now (laughs) if I ever have a chance to go to New York, I know who I'm going to visit. Exactly. I have two extra rooms because I got kids that are just moving out. Oh, see, there you go. (laughs) What do you do with the empty bedrooms when your kids get apartments of their own? So is it weird? Is it weird just you and your husband? I mean, what an adjustment. It's a little strange. It's just us, three cats, and a whole lot of fish, because my husband is an aquarist. He raises Uh. fish. So there's a zillion fish tanks. But, like, it's weird. Like, so much of my identity came from being a mom. And I'm still a mom, but my kids need me in a different way. Right. And, you know, I have a stepdaughter in Florida, and I have um, a, a stepson on Long Island, where I am. But both of my biological children within the next week will be living in Massachusetts. Oh, wow. So, uh, hell if I know. (laughs) That's crazy. My son hasn't really lived home. Maybe he sleeps home like four nights a year because he's been Mm -hmm. away at school and master's program, yada, yada, yada. And now he's moving to Cambridge, Mass. But so his bedroom has been the guest room. But now what do I do with my daughter's room? Like she's going to empty it, take everything that's in there into her new apartment when she moves. And I, I don't know what to do with her room. I mean, I I guess I could make it a yoga studio. I could make it a a, a library. I could make it a cat playhouse. I don't don't know. You can make it a cat house. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know what to do with it, but uh, it's just weird. You know, the evolution of the the, the things that we need the house to do even changes Mm -hmm. as the relationships change. So, Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Fewer mouths to feed you know, fewer people to consult when things are happening, like who's coming home when, or, you know, all of that tumult is gone. And it's weird, weird, Weird. not bad, totally not bad, (laughs) but weird. So, well, you'll figure it out. You always do. (laughs) I always do. (laughs) Thanks again so much, Cheryl. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. I'm going to be losing my voice, so I'm going to sign off right now. Thanks a lot for listening.